start recording. Okay, so we're back in Revelation chapter six, and we're continuing to look at the fourth seal in verses seven and eight. Revelation chapter six, verses seven and eight. Can someone read that for us, please? And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, to kill with sword and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Amen. So we're continuing to look at the, the seals here. This is the fourth seal. Excuse me. It's introduced by the fourth beast who has a face like an like an eagle. Face like an eagle. Thank you, Brother Chris. And pointing especially to the divinity of Christ and what it means for us that God himself uh, became flesh, became human, and lived a perfect life to show us the way that we can live together with him and died the ultimate sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. And that we are in Christ forever united back with the Father and his divinity. And that's connected with this fourth beast, this fourth seal message. About restoration back into God's image. Maturity, we've seen, of either righteousness or if the maturity of unrighteousness for those who are resisting the message. And we have this pale green horse, chloros, where we get the word chlorophyll, which is actually a symbol of life. Chlorophyll is what enables the plant to receive the light from heaven and to power the plant to provide life. And we see here, but the name, the character of him that sat on him was death and hell the grave follows with him and the power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth we've been looking at this fourth part for quite a few studies now and there's still more to look at since it turns out that this idea of the fourth is found all throughout the scriptures and brother craig yes i have a question um when you said that the, the inclusive of the fourth seal is the time of maturity of either uh righteousness or unrighteousness mm -hmm. um could this now as far as the unrighteousness could this also include let's say a person's choice to choose in uh, unhealthy indulgence would that be um, would that be uh, likened to the maturity process of unrighteousness? I mean, well, would that be an, it would depend an on, it would depend on the character of that choice. I mean, this is talking the the end of either whether it's righteousness or unrighteousness, the end is death. The end of righteousness is death to self, which leads to eternal life in Christ. And the end of yeah. unrighteousness is, is eternal death. But at the end, the yeah. maturity, the, the completion of the process, the fruit, as it were, is death, actually. Uh, um, the death of, of sin and unrighteousness, it's going to come to an end. And that's what the, these seals are pointing to, that 
that death process of sin one way or the other either by choice it can die out of us or we ourselves will die you know clinging to our sins one way or the other so just because someone has made intemperate choices doesn't mean they've necessarily reached the maturity in that process but intemperance is one of you know innumerable sins that will come to a pro through a process come to maturity all things you know bear a harvest the, the when the, the seed is planted it it, it it brings forth fruit either the good fruits of god and the spirit of the salvation and life or of the the, the evil poison fruits of of sinful pleasure and indulgence that ultimately leads to death so this fourth seal is is talking about the maturity of this process are we in the fourth seal now brother are we are we in it as I part think of that's the time a, that's a difficult question to answer brother not everybody is at the same place in time the, the judgment process, we're, we're looking at these seals through an anti-typical lens that we've seen through just a study of the word. Always, all of the symbols mm -hmm. in the first four seals have Old Testament links to the process of judgment. And over and over and over again, and there's this end time judgment process that's happening as Christ is taking back dominion over this earth. And there is a, a progression of the messages from God that leads to maturity. And we told, you know, judgment begins at the house of God. Right. And if it begin first for us, what shall be the end of them that know not the gospel? So there are different people. For some people, they may well be facing the, the, the message of the fourth seal. You know, if if the if you're really being convicted as we're studying this, well, that may well be that mean that you are at that point. Um, but not necessarily everybody else is at that point. So we need to keep that in mind. But if every but if everybody is in a different place in that process. Okay, the timing must end at some point. This is what I'm. This is what I'm saying. It, that process cannot go on forever simply because there are still people in the process. There's got to be a time when it moves forward. The Lord. Right? I mean, the Lord is in charge of the process, and He tells us that He will bring it to completion, and that He is bringing it to completion. So yes, it will not go on forever. Um, you know, we saw in in the what happened at the the general conference last week that that the, 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 it's very clear that unrighteousness is coming to a maturity among God's people, who are the first on the list to to come to maturity. The message comes first to his people. God speaks first to his people through his servants, the prophets. And then the message goes out from his people to the other groups. Um, Do you think probation has closed yet for the leadership? Well, that's... <sighs> I don't mean well, to well, put I you mean, on the spot. Uh, uh, you know... I, I don't think God has put me on the earth to announce when people's probation has closed. Um, I don't think that's the purpose that I, he has called me to or even of these studies. And yet we can see that that process is coming to maturity and I believe soon will be brought to completion. And, and there, are, there are reasons, biblical, prophetic reasons to, to think that is the case, brother. And that actually the, the judgment on the whole church is actually imminent.
not just the judgment on the leadership. Um, but it will happen for them. But this is corporate. The, the corporate judgments are different from individual, brother. So even after the stoning of Stephen, after the cross, which was a judgment on the leadership, and the stoning of Stephen, which was a judgment on the Jewish nation as a whole, in both cases, corporately, as a group, uh, any individual, even after the stoning of Stephen, could choose to repent and be saved, and Jesus will accept them. And, you know, we have the example, a perfect example of Saul, who became Paul, who was a leader, who was actually part of the group that stoned Stephen. And yet he actually turned and became a mighty and powerful witness for the Lord. So even if we've reached the point, uh, or imminently are at the point of an antitypical stoning of Stephen, that doesn't mean that individual probation is necessarily closed for anybody. Now, at the same time, because Jesus is still ministering in the sanctuary above, I don't believe the general close of probation for the world has happened. I believe Jesus is still ministering in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And so individuals, any individual can still make a different choice if they've made the wrong choice. Yet at the same time, as God is making these corporate uh, uh, judgments uh, and, and probation closing corporately, it is ultimately a reflection of the fact that, that many members, perhaps even a, quite a large majority of the members of those groups have made decisions such that their hearts are so hardened that they're not going to change their decision. And essentially, their probation has closed. But it's, it's not our purpose to try to determine who's who in that individually. God wants, okay. us to see the, God wants us to see and understand corporately how he's dealing with his people. But it's not our job to know whether some, uh, any particular leader or any particular person truly has, has made their final decision because we don't know. I mean, if, if you had seen Saul back in the, in the days of Stephen and after when Saul was going around persecuting people and, and literally torturing them and putting them to death for believing in Jesus Christ, you know, you, you or I would have easily said, well, he surely is one of the ones whose probation is closed. And yet God turned his heart. And so we, we can't determine the heart. We can't determine what God will be able to do with that heart. We, we wouldn't. So you're have, saying we can't even determine our own hearts. We, we, and we can't even really determine our own hearts. We, could, we have the greatest insight into our own heart because we know our own thoughts. But ultimately, we don't yeah. even really know our own heart. Um, and, and really, our focus ought to be as far as we ought to be daily wrestling with God about where I am with him. And, and am I maturing in righteousness or unrighteousness? We can see the general trend in our own life one way or the other, I'm sure. Um, yes. And, and yes. We ought, and we ought to be wrestling with God about it. Um, and I think that's what's most appropriate and most important. Brother West, did you have a hand up? Yes, brother. Um, um, isn't it also uh, the um, Sunday law that's going to trigger things? Uh, certainly, it's it's generally been our understanding. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists based on uh, most frequently on certain testimonies from God's spirit through Sister White that the Sunday law will play an important role in the progression of the sealing work and the close of probation and how God is dealing with his people. We've seen that, you know, they were Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. And when he would be poured out, that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. That gives us the pattern. Jerusalem was a symbol of the capital of the Jewish nation, and it was the symbol of the leadership 
all Judea, that's the rest of the Jewish nation. And Samaria, that were, were they were the near close relatives of the Jews who most Jews actually hated. And the uh, uttermost parts of the earth, that's the remainder of the group. Interestingly, how many, how many groups are there in that list right there? Four. Again, here we are in the fourth seal. This is the process of maturity that's happening. It's always happening in this pattern of four. And also this uh, three plus one pattern that we've seen, which we're going to talk about a little bit more tonight. But yes, the Sunday law will play a role. And uh, as that happens, that's actually an indication of the message moving from one group to another. As the, you know, we know that the Sunday law doesn't all happen at one time, that there's going to be a progression to the Sunday laws. So first, yes, there are stages. Yes, there'll first be the just no buy or sell, no, no economic activity on Sunday, uh, you know, basically reinstituting Sunday blue laws. Um, and, you know, then there'll be, you know, Sunday observance will be, will be pushed and legislated, but you'll still be able to worship on other days of the week for a time. And then eventually they'll make an anti-Sabbath law. And so it says you can't worship on Sabbath. And you must worship on Sunday. And in that and progression, this, go ahead. In this, this progression, Brother Craig, can it also serve as a shock? In other words, like those who have been um, preached to or those who have been told about this process and what's happening, you know, uh, and, but, but have turned away and didn't believe it, can the, can the actual stages of the Sunday law serve as a shock or a waking up, an alarm it's to certainly, them. It's certainly a possibility, but I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, personally, you know, ever invest in the idea that I can wait until that shock comes um, because most who are, haven't fully committed before that shock comes are going to make the wrong choice when it does. Praise the Lord, there will be some who will like Saul, recognize their error and turn to the Lord. Yeah, but, you know, that, 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 that first, you know, no buy and sell on Sunday, the, just the beginning stage of the so-called Sunday law, it is essentially the corporate close of probation for Adventism. I mean, once Sunday laws are being pushed openly by and passed by the government, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you know the truth about the Sunday and the, sun, and the Sunday law and the Sabbath, whatever choice you make at that point is essentially going to be your final choice. You're exceedingly unlikely to make a different choice, whatever choice it is that you make at that point. Once, in other words, once that comes. Yes. See, most Adventists have been led to believe that the, they'll, they can kind of go on being, you know, mostly for the Lord, but not all on the Lord's side, essentially lukewarm. And that when the Sunday laws start, then they can really buckle down and, 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 and be faithful. Um, but but that's, that's not the case. That's a great deception. Okay. Most of the, most who haven't already committed to God before the crisis comes, will continue making the wrong decisions once the crisis comes. Um, See, that's what was in my mind. That's what was coming over me. What you just said, that deception um, was looming over my mind. That's why I'm asking these questions. And it's, and it's um, imminent. I'm I mean, being... this, this, this start of this process is imminent. <laughs> really, what we've been seeing for the past three years is really, or two to three years, is, is really leading up to the beginning of this Sunday law process. This was like the preparatory phase yeah. almost we've been in. But we're, we're reaching the climax of that preparatory phase. And there's going to be this transition that's coming. And it will involve calamities and judgments that are going to happen. And praise the Lord, the, God will use it to, to shake some awake who have been lukewarm and who have been scoffers. 
and who have opposed those who have been really trying to, to show the people what's happening and urging people to do what's right. And, and some of them will, will come around, praise the Lord. And it will, take, it will take that calamity to get their attention and to basically take away the things of this world that they're clinging to that are preventing them from, from giving all to God. That's really what's going to happen. God's going to start taking away the idols that attach us to this earth. And that through, you know, economic collapse, you know, difficulties and through food shortages and through plagues and through natural disasters and all different kinds of ways. Well, if, I mean, how, how do you, how would God, how would God take away, like if someone is a drug addict or an alcoholic and they're just, you know, indulging in this sinfulness and this indulgence, I mean, how would God just do that? I mean, like that would be an idol. I mean, if, uh, to an alcoholic, alcohol is a, is a, is an idol. Yes. Right. Well, God, I mean, wouldn't can, you say? God can do it many ways, brother. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to box God in and tell him how to do it. Um, but I mean, you, you know, for instance, if, if there's an economic collapse and you have no money left, it's going to be pretty hard to, to buy alcohol. <laughs> and, 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 if, and if food, if just getting food starts costing you 70 or 80 percent or more of your entire income, you're not going to have any money left for, for alcohol or drugs. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that God can do it. The, the person who's and, your, and the, the supply chains that are breaking down and bringing the, the food into your store could break down in the drug trafficking. I mean, who knows? There's all kinds of ways that God could do it. And we'll see how he does that. We, we saw, you know, when you look at the, the plagues on, on Egypt, every single one of the plagues was designed around a particular idol that the Egyptians worshipped. And in, in every case, God was demonstrating that he was more powerful than that worthless idol. And th there are many idols in the hearts of God's people today that need to be broken down and smashed. And God yeah. would have preferred for us to just choose to abandon those idols and choose him because he's good and because he, he bid us to do it for our good. But for those who don't, he doesn't just give up on them. He then starts taking things away in judgments to, to try to get people to turn back to him before it's too late. It's really already starting to happen, and it's going to accelerate. Yeah, brother, uh, if I could, if I could just mention um, one of the brothers here, he's uh, been able to get a. Um, uh, it's called the chart of the Seventh Day Adventist Last Day Events. Okay. Have you ever seen that? Quite possibly, though I'm not certain. There, there, are, there are more than one of those those types yeah. of charts in existence. I've seen at least one of them. This is uh, being done in 1975, okay? okay. Um, if you like, I can forward that to you and you can have a look at it. Yeah, I would love you to do that, please. I, okay. I imagine I'll, it's the one I'm thinking of, but I'd like to see for sure. Yeah, the, okay, the, I'll send it. The, the ones I've seen in general tend to be simultaneously pretty well done and fairly accurate. But I'm not quite sure that all the details are are quite right. Um, yeah. Well, you know, like there's a note on here that says um, a compilation of these references will serve as a a quick study guide. Yes. Um, the references, yes. however, are far from exhaustive. You know. Yes. And yeah. It, but it, I'll, it I'll send it to you. Please. It tends to be the case with most of those types of charts that they're very much largely built on statements from the spirit of prophecy and uh, tend to be a little bit weaker on biblical references to support those positions. And while, you know, praise God for the spirit of prophecy and we believe the spirit of prophecy and it's a, it's a wonderful guide for us, uh, people can just as easily misinterpret the spirit of prophecy as they can the scriptures. 
And if they don't understand the issue from the scriptures first, it's much easier to misunderstand it when Sister White starts talking about it. Um, and so that's why I just always have a little caution with some of those charts, but they're often very useful and I've, I've enjoyed looking at some of them. Um, but I've generally always found at least some things that I think are not quite right in them. Uh, That's okay. I'll, I'll just send it to you. Okay, sir. Oh, thank you, brother. Um, no worries. Let's see. Well, it's taking its time coming around the world, so I'll check again in a minute. Um, so we have this fourth part, and it's the fourth part is is always different from the first three. It's a very common pattern that we've been looking at in this maturation process. We can also see it as we've talked about how in our studies on the typology of seven, that whenever there is a, a prophetic uh, uh, a situation that's connected with the number seven, whether it's based on seven items in a list or, or, or seven years, for instance, or seven days, whatever it is, seven something in a, in a prophetic chiasm, that's a chiasm is the end reflecting the beginning and everything in a chiasm is always pointing to what's in the middle as what's most important. And we've talked about this idea that the fourth is actually in the middle of a seven. If you have seven years, for instance, the middle of the seven years is three and a half, which is really halfway through the fourth year. If you have three and a half years, you have three full years. They're similar to each other. And then you have this fourth year that's different because it's split in two. It's right in the middle so of the fourth year is three and a half. So this fourth thing is transitional. Can we say that that it's that it's like transitional in 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 a way? Absolutely, yes. And so okay. if you take the 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 seven years or the the one week when the Messiah would confirm the covenant from Daniel chapter nine verse twenty seven. And the Messiah shall confirm the covenant for one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So the midst of the week was three and a half years. Jesus had three and a half years of earthly ministry, and then he had three and a half years of heavenly ministry after the cross. Well, in that three and a half years, that, that cross experience that Jesus had for us, the, the focus of all history, the focus of all salvation, the focus of all prophecy, it's the focus, all the focus of everything is centered in the cross. That happened in a time that could be described as a fourth. It was the fourth year, and it was different. It was a transitional time. It was the, the, the death and resurrection experience came during the time of the fourth. Notice how we have the message is centered around death here as we're talking about the fourth seal. And we, when we have this pattern of three plus one making four, and the fourth is different from the first three, again, we've talked about how that happens throughout the scriptures and, many, and also throughout nature in many different places, both in a positive sense and in a negative sense. In, in the parable of the sower, there's four types of ground, by the wayside, the stony ground, the, among thorns, and the good ground. But only one of them, the fourth, involves something good, bearing fruit. That's a transformation. While the other three don't bear fruit, they don't have the transformation. So that's a perfect example from the scriptures. Um, and we've looked at many more. In Daniel chapter 3, there were the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. And then there was a fourth, like the Son of Man. He's different from the other three. And he is the one who brings the transformation of their experience. Um, so again, we have this emphasis on the uh, on the importance of the fourth. 
in, in a negative aspect we've talked about for instance in daniel chapter 7 you have four beasts that rise up out of the sea uh, but the fourth beast is different and even the bible even says that in daniel chapter 7 is diverse or different from the other beasts and it has a transformation as well it's a it's a very negative transformation pagan rome transforms and becomes papal rome which is even greater deception but it's a maturity it's still a maturity process with a transformation connected with this fourth part and by the way we've looked in our prophetic studies that that transformation from pagan rome to papal rome actually happened in the fourth prophetic year of the seven times prophecy or at the time of a, a counterfeit cross right in the midst of of the the seven that god gave to satan to reveal his satanic kingdom first with through pagan dominion and then through papal dominion so this pattern is, is very frequent that we find in the scriptures and there are many other examples we saw the um at the cross the scriptures tell us that four soldiers were actually assigned to crucify jesus and but only uh one of those soldiers received his inner garment that had no seam when they cast lots that inner garment which symbolically represents the righteousness of christ only one of the four got this garment and only one of the four said huh, he surely was the son of god that that fourth one had a transformation that was different from the other three um and i've also talked about how it, it the same pattern also happens in genetics as well um in the meiotic process which is how the the genes cross over between the two parents in the sex cells of the children um the when uh that process happens in a man it always produces four male sex cells or sperm cells at the end of the process all of which are fertile but in a woman the same process produces uh, uh four what should be ending up being four egg cells but immediately upon the completion of the process almost uh three of them almost immediately disintegrate and only one of the four cells actually becomes an egg cell that cell that can have a transformation can bear fruit so this this idea of the three plus one being four and it's it's pointing to the maturity of the process by the way in a chiasm where the four is in the middle of a seven you have one two three and then in the middle of the fourth you know let's say the fourth year in this instance where the cross was in the middle of that fourth year the three and a half years you have the fourth part the cross the death and resurrection experience and then what follows three more years so whether you're starting from the end and coming to the middle or you're starting from the beginning and coming to the middle you have three plus one the fourth being the key part so the fourth is always a very important uh, uh part uh that is pointing to the maturity of the process and we see the same thing here in the four seals that the first four seals all are connected with the four beasts and they are messengers we've seen that the they each have a message to bear each seal is connected with a, a horse and it's a messenger so it has a message for us and there's four messages and then the last three seals we see aren't the same character of message it, it, the, the the last three seals are actually more about the consequences or uh, of the uh, people's choices in reaction to the four messages that come uh, just like we have three angels messages in daniel chapter uh, uh revelation chapter 14 and then in revelation 18 we have a fourth angel that comes down to lighten the earth with the uh, with the lord's glory where the transformation happens at the same time that that 
glory transforming into the image of God, glory is happening in Revelation 18 in the fourth part. We also see that Babylon comes to its maturity and unrighteousness in Revelation 18 at the same time in the time of the fourth, the fourth angel's message, um, which is different in, from the first three in that it's there's this transformative process that happens in the time of the fourth. Yes, Brother Weff? Um, when you look at the um, center of uh, the cross, and that's 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 in the middle of that. Um, uh, well, there's three and a half years either. Um, sorry, that year you've got six months either side of the center. Okay, that, that makes up the fourth year. Yes, hasn't that itself got a uh, chiastic structure within it as well? That, that, absolutely, yes. And then, isn't there chiastic structures on the left? And also on the right of that center. Um, I think we'll eventually come to find out whether it's in this life or the next that there are actually chiastic structures everywhere in the scriptures, and that indeed there are chiasms within chiasms within chiasms all throughout the scriptures, mm -hmm. and that because this is a, a fundamental. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, aspect of God's character and that's why he communicates that way um, all of the prophets wrote in a chiastic way because they were inspired by the mind of God to think that way and that's why they wrote that way and Sister White in our time wrote everything she wrote was, it was, was filled with chiasms um, mm. and uh, I was trying to share in our Friday night studies and messages recently about this idea of repeating patterns and fractals, which is basically the same principles working at many different levels of uh, uh, from, from the macro level to the micro level. And that, that's the, the same idea we see in chiasms. That, you know, you know, for instance, you know, a classic example in the scriptures is the, the first five books of Moses are written in a chiasm. And the center of that chiasm is the book of Leviticus. But within the book of Leviticus, the, the book of Leviticus itself is written in a chiasm. And the center of that chiasm is Leviticus chapter 16, which is about the Day of Atonement. But when you look at the chapter 16 of the book of Leviticus, just that chapter alone is written in a chiasm. And it's actually pointing to, I believe it may be verse 30, is actually the center of that chiasm. So we see that there's uh, an overall chiasm, and then within that there's another smaller chiasm, and within that there's another smaller chiasm all following the same principle and all pointing actually to the same center in that case. Okay, brother, can I just ask one more question? Um, right. So if we look at, um, for instance, say the left-hand center, the, the left hand of the center, yes, that's not a typical event um, uh, or, or happenings of events, okay? Yeah. And then if you look at the right-hand side of the center, that's got a typical type of events. So is the left-hand side a particular type of event only and the right-hand side uh, that typical type of event only or are they mixed? Uh, um, do they cross over? If I'm understanding your question, uh, I would say they tend to have the same characteristics, whether they're to the left side or to the right side. Um, like, right. di uh -huh. you know, if it, it, different chiasm that you find throughout the scriptures tend to have the same types of principles being revealed on the left side and then on the right side, because one is the, it's essentially, I've, as I had a study, the left side is, is connected with the before the cross experience and the right side is connected with the after the cross experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, I, I would, I wouldn't be so bold as to do, 
declare that I understand all chiasms and can say definitively that it's always that case. But I think I tend to see that pattern very frequently throughout the okay. years. Mm -hmm. so it, do, right. it does tend to follow that, but you know, there can always be exceptions to the rule. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to be open to God's spirit showing us these things. Um, but yes, you know, that, that's a, uh, an important thing to see that that's actually very helpful when we, we, we can use the cross as what I've come to like to describe as it's not just a type and an anti-type, and it's actually both. It's what I like to refer to as an archetype. And an archetype is an overruling type that applies sort of in all situations. The cross is the great true center of the chiasm. And it's connected with the pattern of seven. And the patterns that we find connected with this pattern of seven of perfection, with the cross at the center at the, in the time of the fourth, of the time of the coming of maturity, righteousness came to the maturity of perfection at the cross in Jesus Christ. And unrighteousness came to a maturity of perfection in the, you know, the mob who put Jesus to death. That was especially led by the Jewish leaders, the, the religious leaders, the priests, the chief priests and the scribes, I believe the scriptures tell us, were the ones that let out the mob in crucifying Jesus. And also the, the, the perfection of unrighteousness revealed in the rebellion of Satan was also revealed at the cross, at the center of the chiasm in the time of the fourth. And so everything that we know connected with from the baptism of John to the cross, which is basically all of the gospels, <laughs> all four gospels are really almost entirely before the cross until the, the end of the gospels brings you to the maturity of the cross process. And then it's the book of Acts and the epistles that are found after the cross. And so we can see that that's a general pattern that often frequently can be found even in crosses and, and, and uh, chiasms that we find in the Old Testament scriptures. Because okay, brother, can I just ask really one final question? Yes. Can please, I just yes. ask one final question? Where your sheets that you've made up with the, the cross being the center, yes. if you line up each of those sheets to yeah. the center, then whatever section you're looking at vertically, that should line up on each of those sheets. Is that correct? Pretty much, yes. That's right. Yeah. Okay, right. Because I've got to try and show a few of the brothers what they're like. So I'm just double checking to make sure I don't I don't want to make a you know fool of uh, myself or whatever, you know. <laughs> No, that, 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 that's generally a pretty good insight, Brother West. There, there, there is one exception on that chart to that principle, and that is the destruction of Jerusalem is on the second page, um, well, connected with the, the, the main cross of Christ, which was in the seven. But then I also show that after, after the cross, when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, that there was actually a seven-year period that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem that was broken up into two, three and a half year periods. Um, but all of that, even though it's following the pattern of the cross itself, all of that's happening after the cross. So th this is where you can see a, a, a sort of a, almost like a, a mini pattern that's within the larger pattern in a sense. Okay. So right. it, it wouldn't line up vertically for that particular, that particular one, but otherwise okay. the answer is yes. All right. Okay. Thanks, brother. Praise God. And I, I could have done a separate page for that, and then it would, but I just was trying to limit how many pages I had in that particular chart. Um, and it worked out that, uh, you know, I didn't even think of it at the time, but it actually does have four pages, and three are similar, and one's a little bit different, but that's the one that has all of them on the that first the first page on that chart actually has sort of all of them together where you can kind of see it lined up vertically um so 
and I'm trying, this is something that, you know, I'm still coming to fully understand and I'm trying to help other people see the principles from the scriptures and from, from the created things in nature that help us to understand how God communicates. And he does so, it's very clear that he communicates through patterns is one of the ways that he communicates. And this pattern of the cross and the, this, the cross uh, and it being at the center in the time of the fourth is very important and can tie together many different stories throughout the scriptures when you see the pattern and you see it repeating. And I think that's very helpful. That, that gets to the whole idea of, I've been talking about the effect of every vision of all the visions of the scriptures having one final antitypical fulfillment at the same time overlaid upon each other. And this pattern of seven with the cross at the middle is the archetype, the overriding pattern in which all the other visions fall into line underneath it, according to that greater pattern revealed at the cross. So, so we have this happening everywhere in the scriptures and in prophecy. Um, another one I didn't think of and I, or I mentioned earlier is there's four main kingdoms revealed in the scriptures prophetically. There's two in the church and two in the world. In the church, there was the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. In the world, there was the king of the north and the king of the south. But of those four, only one of them bore fruit. The southern kingdom of Judah. The, Jesus himself told us salvation is of the Jews or of the Judeans. Um, so if you have a king of the north mindset, you have a king of the south mindset, or you have the mindset within the church, but you have a mindset of the northern kingdom of Israel, none of those will bear fruit. They'll all lead to destruction. They're the by the wayside and the stony ground and the among thorns. The good ground is found in the southern kingdom of Judah because that's where the, the holy city was. That's where the holy temple was. That's where the holy place and the most holy place were. The sanctuary message is found. That's where the ministration of the Levites was to teach you the truth. That's where you found the oracles of God. The scriptures were held in Jerusalem. That's why it's the one that can bear fruit, even though they often, even the southern kingdom of Judah often did things wrong and God had to chastise them in a process of seven. <laughs> but they, the ones who accept the sanctuary message and salvation in Jesus Christ, they can have the transformation and bear fruit. So even in all prophecy and history, there's this pattern of three plus one and a maturity happening together with it. Um, well, it was my purpose tonight to actually see this idea in the book of Amos, but it's kind of getting late already. So maybe I'll save that for next week. Um, Sorry, I opened up the doors to all kinds of questions. I no, I think, I, I think these questions are very important and, you know, we're studying a lot of deep ideas here and um, I think it's important to, to stop and take time and ask questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the questions and I'm hoping that it's helping you guys to understand it better and it, it actually helps me to understand it better as I try to answer the questions. So I'm, I'm thankful for the process. Uh, by the way, Brother Wes, I have not seen that particular chart. So I will have to investigate it now very closely. You um, haven't seen it? Um, no. Hmm. There, there are quite a few other ones that I've seen that are, are pretty good, but not that particular one. So okay. I'll be very interested to see what it says. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. Um, any other questions? We'll see if you, you want to read ahead for next week when we look at the book of Amos in chapters one and two, over and over and over again, as God is talking about the judgments that he's going to have to bring on all the nations and even on his own people eventually, he describes it by saying, for three transgressions and for four, which is a very strange way to talk. 
normal people don't talk like that. But God talks like that because God understands the pattern that he's already put in many other places in the scriptures. And what's happening here in the book of Amos is, is helping it to explain to us about this process of the three plus one making four. And the four being different where the transformation happens as it comes to maturity. Um, and there, there are other ones that we need, we haven't looked at as well. Um, Proverbs chapter 30 also has a similar idea there in a different context. But I can, uh, here, where is it? Any other questions or thoughts? Just pulling out my chart right now for a moment. Uh, if I switch my share. So here is our my, my chart on the typology of seven. And you know, here this first page is where we have you know all of the three other pages in just summary format, so you can kind of see them where they and how they line up at the cross in each case. And you have the 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 you know, you can look down vertically and see how they pair up in time, but on that first one over here on the right, you see that seven year period connected with the destruction of Jerusalem, which you also see here on this one. That isn't quite lined up, but you could, you could think of it as being lined up in the same way that the first three and a half years leading up to, of, of the seven leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem are, are separated by the second. And there is this kind of cross experience in the middle that is a transformation and that that was actually when all of the uh all of the christians fled and escaped was in the middle was in the midst when the transformation happened um yeah yeah got it got it no problem thanks brother praise god um and uh, so the three, the, the fourth is always here in the center of the seven. It's the center of, of a, a chiasm made up of seven. The fourth is always the center. And God especially likes to make chiasms out of sevens <laughs> all throughout the scriptures. And especially in Moses and Daniel and Revelation. So... From the beginning of the Bible to the prophetic books of Daniel Revelation, it's the same pattern happens over and over again. And I try to put a lot of references here on this chart to what's happening and explanations. And then, so you have the, the seven around the cross, that's the archetype. That's why it's the first one. It's the main pattern. That's why I call it the archetype. The arc means ruler, the arch over your head. Uh, like the rainbow is above the throne, the arch over his head, the symbol of his rulership. So that's why it's an arc, a type, the ruling type that, that whether rules over, whether it's a type or whether it's an anti-type, it's ruled by the archetype. Um, and some are both. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cross is an anti-type of, of the, the typical system of sacrifice. But at the same time, the cross is a type in the sense that it's a pattern for every Christian who has to take up his cross and follow Jesus. So the cross is both a type and an anti-type at the same time. And it's actually the archetype. It's the overriding pattern. Sort of in a similar way, the, the heavenly sanctuary is both a type and an anti-type. So the earthly sanctuary was modeled after the heavenly sanctuary. God told Moses to, to be sure to make all things according to the pattern showed him in the mount. 
the pattern that was showed him in the mount is the heavenly sanctuary. That word pattern means type. So the heavenly sanctuary was the pattern or the type that was what the earthly sanctuary was modeled on. It, be, it was, the, in a sense, almost like an antitype of the type because it was modeled on the type. And yet the earthly sanctuary is actually a type of the heavenly sanctuary itself, which is the antitype. So they're both a type and an antitype at the same time. But that's sort of this chiastic idea of the end mirroring the beginning. There's always a mirror reflection. If, if you have this pattern of, let's say, for instance, here, the seven with the cross in the middle, it, the, each side, whether it's to the left or the, to the right, is a mirror image of the other. And that, that happens here, uh, is always connected with the chiasm. There's this mirror image ha that happens. It's a reflection. And of course, a reflection reveals an image. It's a mirror image. And when we behold God, we're changed into his image, right? Or if we worship images, we're going to become like them. And so the idea of images and reflections is actually a very important idea in the scriptures. Because everything you behold, you become like. And when you behold in the mirror, that you see what you're like. <laughs> it's very interesting <laughs> how God works and how he uses the things that we know and that he created to help us understand these ideas better. And so we want to we ultimately behold the cross. That's where we're changed. By beholding, we're changed from glory to glory. And so when we behold the pattern of seven and we can see it and we understand the pattern, the elements to it, and we can understand how there's this progression and there's a maturity and there's a before the cross experience and an after the cross experience and there's characteristics associated with both. And then we start seeing that pattern other way in other places that's changing us. That's, 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 it's working on changing our mind in the way we think, which is, you know, the, the process of, of being transformed and sealed by God is about changing the way we think. God is trying to deal with our wrong thinking. You know, as, as you know, we often are most concerned about our wrong behavior. I know I am, and I know I you know, especially used to be even more, especially as a former Catholic. My focus was on behavior. And I do this wrong and I do that wrong. And wow, I did that wrong again. And I didn't think I was going to do that. But wow, well, there I go. I did it again. And, and you, we, we have a tendency to focus on our behavior. But God is actually not nearly as concerned with our behavior as we are. God cares about our behavior and our wrong things. But he recognizes that that's not the problem, actually. The problem is the wrong thinking that leads to the wrong behavior. So God's emphasis isn't, isn't on changing our behavior. God's emphasis is on changing our thinking. Because if he can change the way we think, the behavior problems will resolve of themselves. We'll behave differently when we think differently. That's what will lead to different choices, the right choices. And the way that he makes helps us to think differently is by focusing on his word. We have to put in the right thoughts to replace the wrong thoughts. The wrong thoughts don't just go away. The only way to really get rid of the, uh, the wrong thoughts is to crowd them out with the right thoughts. Have you, have you ever noticed that it's impossible to remember everything that you've experienced in this life? Yes? Are, are there many, many things that you've done and seen in your life that you don't remember anymore? Definitely. Yes. And that we, we often think of that as a curse. I wish I could have a better memory to remember. But in many ways in this world of sin, a, a failing memory is actually a blessing because there's many things that we did wrong that it's probably best for us not to remember. And we, we have a finite capacity to remember to have a stored memory in our minds. 
We're not infinite, we're finite. And so, and we have a tendency to better remember that which is in our short-term memory rather than our long-term memory. What, whatever we're most recently been focusing on, isn't that what we re remember the best? You know, how, how many people who had a test the next day crammed the night before so they could get as much on that topic in their mind to bring out of their short-term memory recall to try to do good on the test. Um, staying up all night, by the way, is not a very good idea. I always got a good night's sleep and I tended to do good on my tests, whether or not I had crammed a night before or not. But that's what we tend to do because we do understand the idea that whatever I've been most recently focusing on, that's what I'm, is clearest in my memory because it's 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 more readily recalled so if i am putting in good thoughts all the time as much as possible studying god's word starting my day with his words thinking about his word all day long then what's going to come to my memory is going to be god's word <laughs> because that's what's in my short-term memory is god's word if I'm focusing on the things of the world and the images of the world, that's what's going to come into my memory. So if I want to crowd out the, the bad thoughts, which aren't going to immediately just go away because I've done a lot of bad things and had a lot of bad thoughts and listened to a lot of other people's bad suggestions and thoughts. But if I start putting God's thoughts in more and more and more, eventually your, your mind can't keep track of all the information that you have and it starts pruning off things that you're not focusing on anymore that aren't as important right now and and starts consolidating the memories of what you're focusing on and in that process as, as long as you keep putting more good in then there'll be more bad going out that, that's forgotten and you you'll more and more only be able to recall the good and th th this is the, the transformative sealing process that God is doing. And he doesn't just do it directly through his word, but God also has patterns in his word. And those patterns can also affect our thinking. And uh, that is part of what God is trying to do now in this process of maturity is to help us to, to see, you know, there's so much information just in the Bible alone to try to remember and keep track of. But when you start realizing that there's just a few really key patterns that apply to all of the scriptures, then it starts to make it easier to actually remember and recall them because you recognize them as being connected with the, the one simple pattern, the pattern here of the cross in the middle of the seven. So that's, that's the archetypal pattern at the cross. The seven years leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem is following a similar pattern. And then we have these two patterns of seven in history that we've studied. The seven times of the Gentiles and the seven times chastisement of the church. And then the, the idea according to the day-year-day -day principle of interpretation that these patterns are all repeating in a final end time seven year period right now. Though I have been studying and talking, especially with Pastor Tim about the idea that there may well be another three and a half year or, or seven year pattern that's still yet to happen. And like in the times of the the story of Joseph and his dreams, there was actually two sevens together, one after the other. And uh, still wrestling with God to uh, better understand that from his word. But for now, we can see these patterns are definitely repeating in our time. And we're nearly at the end of the seven. But see, that, that's maybe one last thought we can finish up with. We talked about earlier how not everybody is in the same place of the pattern as, as others, correct? 
that people in the church are going to go through this pattern of seven that leads them to the cross in the middle first. It happens first for the church. But as the message expands out to Samaria, the near close relatives who have mingled with the heathen in idolatry, that would be the Sunday church is for us today, and then the uttermost parts of the earth, that their pattern of seven is, is delayed compared to ours. They're behind in the process. And so, for, for instance, in this pattern of seven that we've been talking about, which is especially a pattern for the church, just like in the days of Christ, the archetypal pattern in Daniel chapter uh, uh, nine, 70 weeks are determined, cut off for thy people, Daniel, and for thy holy city. This last seven, when the Messiah confirmed the covenant, was especially just for the Jews. It was the seven with the cross in the middle for the Jewish nation. But as the message went to the Samaritans and the uttermost parts of the earth after the stoning of Stephen, when, when at the time of the stoning of Stephen, the message, say, turned and they went to Samaria and Philip preached down to Samaria. That was the first time that they were hearing about the cross in Samaria. It was three and a half years after the cross. And so for the Samaritans, their cross was actually at the end of the pattern of seven for the Jews. So their, their seven actually started at the cross and their maturity or cross experience happened at the time of the stoning of Stephen, which was actually the end of the pattern of seven for the Jews. But it was the middle of the pattern of seven for the Samaritans. And then it was only later that the message went to the uttermost parts of the earth, went all around the known world at that time. And there were many who, much later than that, only first heard about the cross. And you see that in some of the later uh, chapters in the book of Acts. And so for them, their cross experience came much later. Their pattern of seven is, is shifted to the right here in this uh, uh, timeline that we have here. And so while this, this stoning of Stephen, and we are talking about how we're approaching the time of the antitypical stoning of Stephen this year, while that's the end of the pattern of the seven, that's especially for the modern Jews, which would be Seventh-day Adventists, the ones who have the sanctuary message and the oracles of God, and the testimonies of his spirit and the teaching of the Levites, we're approaching the end of the pattern of the seven for Adventists, but it's actually, as a Sunday law starts to come in, that's actually going to be the cross experience, the center of this pattern of seven for the other, the, the Sunday keeping Christians. They've not heard this before, most of them. And so they're shifted, they're delayed in the process, but they're still going through the same process. They still have to go through the, the complete pattern of seven with their before the cross experience and their after the cross experience. But their cross experience doesn't line up with our cross experience. Our cross experience comes before them. So the cross that's here in the middle, there's actually another cross here at the end, but it's for a different group. And then there's actually another cross after that that's for a different group who are going through the same process, but delayed because they're getting the information later. And that's this fractal idea that the same pattern is, is happening on different levels at different times for different people. But it's still the same pattern in each case. So there's one way to look at everything that's happening right now, especially for Adventists, is actually the end of the pattern of seven. And it's an antitypical stoning of Stephen. We're also going to see it's an antitypical 1798 because that's the end of the pattern of seven in history. But at the same time, it's going to be the middle of the pattern, the, the, the maturity of the process for, uh, for others, for particularly for the Sunday church people.
as the Sunday issue starts being more agitated and comes into the public limelight. And really, that's already starting to happen. It's just not talked about as much as it will be soon. So that's how this understanding this archetypal pattern can help us to really come to better understand what's happening now as it's repeating in the same way for different groups at different times, starting at the house of God and with the ancient men before the sanctuary, which would be the church that has the sanctuary message, which is our church. But we're, we're approaching the end of this pattern. And, and see what, what happens is as we approach, approach the end of the pattern, the va we see the vast majority are forsaking the everlasting gospel just like they did in Christ's day, but that there are faithful witnesses who are standing up and are being sealed in giving their testimony for the truth. And then the faithful ones, who, you know, the two groups are being formed. As this process of seven is going forth, two groups are always being formed. Those who submit and obey and those who resist and rebel. As, as, the, as the cross and the self-denial of the cross is preached, there's two groups formed always. And as they as this process for God's, for the, the first group, for the, the group that has the sanctuary message, as it comes to a maturity and completion in the time of the end of the seven, the faithful ones that are the group that is faithful out of that, which is going to be a very small remnant from within the remnant, they then take the message to the next group. In this case, that would be the Sunday church keeping. And as we bring the message to them, they come to their cross experience. And then the same process is going to happen for the Sunday churches. And God's going to give them time. It might even be a seven <laughs> to, to understand and make an intelligent choice because God knows this is a final choice for eternity. But as that process happens, There'll be ones who submit and obey from the Sunday church uh, uh, camp and come and turn to the Lord and, and accept his true Sabbath and stand for the truth with, together with the faithful ones from the first group. And then there'll be a large group of the Sunday church people who, who resist and rebel. And they join the resist and the rebel group from, from the first group. And then the, the, the faithful ones from the first group, who if they're still alive and haven't been martyred, and the faithful ones from the second group join together, and they together bring the message to the rest, to the last group, the rest of the world. And then the rest of the world, they then have their cross experience. And then God's going to have to give them some time to consider and to choose and to intelligently understand. As the process of seven is brought to a completion for each group. And it's the, the final work of perfect judgment. That's why it's a seven. It's the, it's the revelation of perfect righteousness. That's why it's a seven. And it's about character perfection. That's why it's a seven. And it takes the completion of the full process of seven to bring it to perfection. So while most of this chart, as I've currently had it for a few years now, is, is, is vertical, as you kind of noticed, you can line it up vertically, Brother Wes. But at the same time, kind of here in this last uh, stage in our time, the, it, it can almost shift to the right. But it, you can think of it as each group comes to their cross, they have the, the left and the right, the before and after experience. Yeah, okay. But yeah. it's shifting to the right along the timeline for different groups. But it's yeah, still, yeah. It, for each group, it's the same process. Just some go through it sooner and some go through it later. Yep. Yeah. Okay.
And, and by the way, in, until the completion of the, the final group is brought to the, the, in the completion and end of their set process of seven, the general close of probation in the world doesn't end until the end of the last group. And up until that, that end of the last group uh, is brought to completion, any individual can still repent and be saved. As long as they're still alive, right up to that general close of probation, any individual can still has the, the, uh, the capability of changing their mind and making a different choice, one way or the other, for good or for bad. But the, 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 the case of the matter is, is that as we get closer and closer to the end of that final group, almost everybody has made their final choice and they're not going to change their mind. And that's the sealing work. This idea that we've been told the, the, to be sealed in your mind is to, to be so settled in the truth that you can't be moved, but you can be so settled into error that you can't be moved. In either, in both groups, you're being sealed, settled into what you think you believe to the point that you, you, you can't be moved to switch to a different group anymore. And that's, that's what this final work is being done. This is what God, in order to complete the, the, the judgment in a judgment of the living, he has to bring everybody to where they're still alive, but are no longer going to change their mind about their choice ever, no matter what happens. And that's, that's the process that's already begun now and is going to continue to move forward and accelerate. Is this process that's leading everybody to choose, make their choice to submit and obey under the, the righteous rule of the great king or to, to follow the dictates of their own heart and of the world to keep their, their power and prestige and their wealth or whatever other idols that they have in this world that they're not willing to give up for the eternal weight of glory of, of choosing Jesus Christ. So th this is this is the, the the why this this understanding this pattern of seven and understanding how the the the, the center of the chi's and the middle of the process is connected with the four this is is the, the maturity that's happening and then it moves on so in, in this first pattern of seven the, at the cross halfway through it, it matured for the leaders. The leaders were brought to make their choice. Oops, I'm on the wrong. Yeah, the leaders in the time of Christ were brought to to make a choice, and they chose against the truth. They said, "We have no king but Caesar, and his blood is on us and on our children." They they rejected Christ as their king. They refused to submit and obey. They said in their hearts, "We will not have this man to rule over us or to reign over us," as the scriptures tell us, and so. They came, it was, the leaders really came to their cross experience here at the actual cross. But it really wasn't until after that, that many in Israel really learned the truth about the cross and had it preached to them through the apostles. And so for others, their cross experience happened after the cross. And their pattern of seven extends beyond because of that. So we, we, we can see clearly how it happened in the days of Christ. And we understand that the, this very pattern is the one that's repeating in our time. And so that can give us insight in how the process is proceeding today. And, you know, the, 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 for the vast majority of leaders in our church, they already came to their cross experience back in 2019. Um, and now we're coming to the point where the, the rest of the church, all Judea, is coming to their cross experience. And then it's going to very soon shift to the next group, to, to the Sunday keeping churches, would be for our time, the Samaritans of our day. And, and we can 
exactly how that shift is going to happen, you know, we can only speculate about, but the idea that it would, would be connected with this beginning of the transition of the Sunday law that we talked about earlier, with the, the restricting business activity on Sunday, would seem to be a logical way to have the message shift from Adventism to the Sunday churches, as the message is now being agitated in a way that the Sunday churches have to pay attention, where the Sunday churches aren't paying attention in the same way now, because they don't have the same insight. That, that is essentially what I expect what we will see happen. But we can also see how the process is going to have to extend you know, quite a bit after the end of the seven as the message shifts to other groups to give them time to learn and understand. But Adventism is, is reaching, you know, the point of decision. God is making truth and error so plain within the church right now that, you know, you have to choose one side or the other. Because it's so stark, the, 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 the division between the two groups. And uh, that, that, that will continue. Those who are expecting some great universal unity to come to the, the visible body are, are looking for something that's never going to happen. The, the unity is going to happen and is happening, but it's only among those that are submitting and obeying, which is uh, the, the vast you know, minority compared to the majority. Okay, that's a lot. Uh, any last thoughts or questions? Uh, thanks for that, brother. There's God. Um, here, can uh, you close us in prayer, Brother Wes? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, our Lord God Almighty, that um, through the Holy Spirit, we're able to um, gain some more knowledge as to what uh, your Holy Word says. Thank you for the protection that you give us. Thank you for what you provide for us. And uh, may the... Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, and show us the way. Amen. Amen, brother.